Jason, you are, um, you're the first one of these. And I don't know how these are going to be, <laughs> uh, but the idea is to do a check-in with an alum, and I, uh, and uh, I I don't really have an agenda other than to just pick and choose some alumni that are doing some cool things and get caught up. That's really so just this. This could either take off or we could like destroy the idea in its infancy. Either <laughs> it could go, it could go nowhere from here. Yeah, right, you're right. Exactly. You're exactly right. So. <laughs> Expectations are low. Um, ambition is high. Great. Right. Um, so that hope I hope that hope you're fine with that. Uh, Absolutely. With parameters. Um, I also don't plan to take any more than thirty minutes of your time. So great. Sounds good. Um, so uh, Jason, we went to school together. Uh, we both graduated in 1998. I don't know if I've seen you since then. Um, Not in person. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did see your dad though. Um, at the Lakeland. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I've been to one camp. of those. I don't know if you were like, I ran to Scott Giffen there. And yeah. um, I do know I, I was, I, I went back to Greenville uh, the, the 10 year. I don't I don't remember if you were there or not, because I was brought back to uh, the Outstanding Young Alumnus or whatever and gave the speech and talked to a few yeah. acting classes. And I did go to the 10 year. Yeah. I, think I remember going to a dinner and I forget who all was there. Uh, it yeah. was a dinner at some restaurant that doesn't, no, it wasn't a restaurant. It was a, uh, just a venue downtown on the square. And I remember a few people, it wasn't very well attended. I remember, I remember <laughs> that, but that's okay. That's good. Yeah. So, or maybe it was 10 year homecoming. Cause I was, I was at, I was there during the day. Like the, the, yeah. the, the, I was at chapel and yeah. went to a few classes and stuff like that. Yeah. Huh. Great. Well, so uh, how are you and what have you been doing for the last 20, <laughs> 20 25 years? years. <laughs> 30 minutes, right? Uh, 30, no, minutes, so, um, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am down in Sarasota, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, right after Greenville, I uh, I hung out for a year around and I, my brother Wes was still there and I still wanted to play Ultimate Frisbee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I uh, did some substitute teaching and directed Romeo and Juliet at the high school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, worked in the registrar's office there at Greenville for a little bit. Um, but then, and I was commuting to St. Louis. I just started auditioning. Okay. And so I was doing that hike four or okay. five times a week, um, for rehearsals and shows. And that got to the point where it's just like, man, and, and I mentioned Scott Giffen, he had moved to St. Louis mm -hmm. and I ended up crashing on his couch a couple of times during mm -hmm. rehearsals and shows. Um, and being in St. Louis, I was like, Ooh, the big bad city. Um, so kind of on a wing of a prayer, I just moved to St. Louis. Um, Alan Harshman, who mm -hmm. went to Greenville and was like on the maintenance crew there for a while. He right. was auditioning as we ended up being roommates, rented a house together in an apartment. Um, and yeah, I just started doing the freelance actor thing. Uh, kept expecting to go off to grad school, but you go to grad school so you can get work and I was getting work. So mm -hmm. I just kept auditioning, working my way up the professional ladder in St. Louis, started directing, started doing other stuff in theater, um, teaching, um, yeah, and just and built myself almost by accident a really, really thriving theater career in St. Louis. It's a surprisingly strong theater town. Mm. Um, there's the big, the big kids on the block, you know, the Muni and the Rep and St. Mm -hmm. Louis Shakespeare Festival and um, Stage of St. Louis, a lot of, you know, but then there's like anywhere from 12 to 24 mid sized professional companies, depending on who's there and what's going mm -hmm. on, that could pay a decent salary. Mm. Um, so I built up a really strong resume, started directing as well. Um, yeah, and then I, I did end up uh, meeting my my ex-wife. We met uh, in St. Louis. She was from St. Louis, like hardcore all the way, you know, grew up in one house her whole life, oh. Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, you know, my, we were totally opposite. We were all over the place moving. Yeah. So, uh, um, and she was also in theater. And so I just, for several years in St. Louis, just lived kind of the theater freelance life um uh ended up doing a lot of not all theater pays great ended up doing a lot of uh university teaching uh because i did end up going to wash U for my master's mm -hmm. in drama and to lindenwood out in st charles for an mfa in directing so i was knocking out those degrees while i was still freelancing and after i got that mfa you know then i was able to apply for college jobs so mm -hmm. i taught adjunct at Fontbonne and at SIUE and at Wash U 
and at SLU. <laughs> all over the place. All over the place. And then landed, uh, I had a visiting assistant professorship appointment for three years at University of Missouri St. Louis up there in Florence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that I almost, I was sniffing the tenure track there. It didn't work out, but that ended up being a gift because uh, it forced me to kind of go back to the drawing board. And I ended up taking a job in Rolla, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, at Ozark Actors Theater. <clears throat> I was producing artistic director there for four seasons. So that was another commute, <laughs> 100 miles each way, because yeah. uh, I was still in St. Louis, but doing yeah. that. Um, and then uh, my marriage did not last. So as that was ending, and I'd kind of hit the professional ceiling in St. Louis at the same time, it's one of those classic things. You probably experienced this too, Dwayne, in some, in some sense, but uh, uh, the prophet's never welcome in his own home. <laughs> so, you know, all the big, I'm going to hire that New York actor or that Chicago actor. But if you're in Chicago, yeah. I'm going to hire that Phoenix actor or that LA actor, right? There's a weird kind of like, if you're too familiar with it or something, yeah. um, even though audiences love seeing the same person back, there's this mm -hmm. weird idea that you have to hire outside to yeah. get quality. Right. And St. Louis has kind of an inferiority complex anyway. Okay, um, it's true. So theater, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like well, now Chicago. It's right. I wish it was nineteen oh four World's Fair all over again. Yeah, um, that was our high point. Um, so it was like one of those things where I would get to play Horatio at the Shakespeare Festival, but not Hamlet. I could play, mm -hmm. you know, Banquo in the Scottish play at the Rep, but not Macbeth. That had to come from New York. You know, there was this weird ceiling. Um, so I had this job. With, Job in Rolla, and so that was it, and the marriage. I mean, so it was just time to kind of see what else might be out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I just threw the resumes to the wind and uh, interviewed for several different things, but ended up landing at Florida Studio Theater in Sarasota, Florida. I just moved down, not knowing anybody, mm -hmm. but it was an associate artist position, and uh, it was great. Um, I get kind of bumped me up into that national level of theater. Met so many people. Was and worked with a lot more New York actors, but. Uh, um, thriving theater, lots of great art. Sarasota is an art heavy town for how big mm -hmm. it's like, it's kind of a cultural jewel down here. Okay. Uh, there's an opera, there's a jazz festival, there's a film festival, there's three big theaters in this like town, a tenth the size of St. Louis. It's, it's kind of amazing mm -hmm. per capita. There are more theater seats per capita in Sarasota than in New York. Come on. Per capita, there are more theater yeah. seats in Sarasota. So it's so a that was, for arts, it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I fit in really well. Really loved it down here. Um, yeah. Met my new current partner, Rebecca. Um, and uh, we have a house. We got two dogs uh, and a pool. Uh, it's Florida. Um, but after 10 years at FST, um, especially with the pandemic and everything else, the lockdown, um, as a lot of people did, you did a lot of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And since you couldn't do theater during lockdown, right? Um, I ended up writing a lot. I wrote my first cabaret. I wrote my first book. I edited my first, you know, and just it was to keep the creative juices flowing. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that FST kept me on as a full time employee. And uh, I worked with a ton of playwrights, helping them write their plays, preparing for reopening. Um, but being home, that the, the theater lifestyle, yeah, theater's not just a job, it is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We work. When so. civilians play, you know, nights, weekends, holidays, yeah. always work. Mm -hmm. um, so to be home with the pups, yeah. with my gal, uh -huh. a lot. I love to cook, being home, you know, just kind of was like, man, I have not felt this kind of just space and relaxation and access to my creativity. When you're directing seven shows a year and teaching 20 classes a year, it's just like there comes a point where you're just throwing up anything just because the deadline is looming. Yeah. And that sense of digging into a project, I realized I had really lost that. So we reopened, or we opened strong. The theater's still going great, but I, I had a moment where I, I, the grind of that theater lifestyle, mm -hmm. I was just, I, I couldn't, I hit that place. Yeah. So it was very difficult. I gave my boss a resignation letter. <laughs> it felt horrible. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't a burned bridges exercise like i i've worked with them a few times already since you know freelancing to direct a couple readings i'm on their radar um i just wrote and directed a one-man show for a different you know it's it's not that theater was like be gone it was i need to pivot and the writing and back at greenville i had double majored in english and theater mm -hmm. and i remember so clearly i was in it was the old hogue hall i was yeah. on floor two 
Yeah. Uh, at Dr. A Strike Hart's office. And I was outside her office looking at that big board with all the grad school flyers on it. Right. I remember those. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and she walks by and goes, You should go to grad school. I was like, Oh, mm -hmm. well, maybe, maybe I should. But it was always going to be is it theater or writing? Mm -hmm. I was torn between creative writing and theater for grad school. And then St. Louis sort of made the choice for me in terms of the theater career just took off. Mm -hmm. But writing's always been in my back, you know. It, my, I remember so clearly in fourth grade, I wrote a story that won an award and it was put on the wall by the principal. And it, yeah. 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 But it's still storytelling, right? It's still storytelling. Sure. Just now with theater, instead of a group audience and we're all sharing the same top synchronous time, mm -hmm. I'm now writing something that one person's going to experience on asynchronous time on their own schedule. And I'm not looming over them, reading over their shoulders. They read it, right? right. I'm not there. Um, so it's a different exercise for sure, but wow it, so i pip, i learned all about self-publishing and then i started a little publishing imprint and so i'm publishing my own work i'm publishing books by other authors right. i'm yeah, doing a right. lot of editing and coaching on writing and uh, still picking up you know other stuff where still teaching mm -hmm. um but yeah it's it's very much i can kind of build my own schedule have my own agency i'm still you know it's it's still a grind in its own yeah. way you know the act of writing does not make you money <laughs> you have to sell it. <laughs> right. Sure, sure. Um, and so that's the other thing. I'm on a crash course on marketing and a website and email list and all the all the stuff that some people love to do. And I'm like, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't regret leaving FST. I still root for them. I'm still here with them. But my life has definitely changed since that lockdown. And I'm focused so much more on the writing side of things mm -hmm. and the publishing side of things. Yeah. That was a right. very long answer to your question, but I no, think that's, that's the nutshell. That was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. You, so you, you, you're you kind of on your own then in terms of uh, you have a lot of time to write. You have a lot of time to be at home. You're, you're your own boss, effectively. Yeah. Um, and so you, like, it sounds like you have the publishing company and you're, you're publishing other books. Are you writing, are you still writing books? Are you still? Yes. Um, so I have kind of a three prong approach that I've yeah. developed over this just over a year now since I left my full time theater gig. Mm -hmm. um, first thing in the morning is always I write my own stuff. OK. Right. So I have a series of thrillers I've written okay. about an actor who becomes a vigilante. <laughs> <laughs> it is not autobiographical. Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> There's something I need to know here. <laughs> <I'll> stop recording. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's like yeah. if you know Batman, Ian McKellen, and you know Jack Reacher had a baby. You know, it's yeah. That kind of, um, uh, so I have that series of thrillers. That sounds fascinating. Um, yeah. Uh, but I've also written. Uh, I also was then commissioned. I've written my newest project was a one man show that I wrote for an actor who's lived his whole life with a lot of mental illnesses, Ooh. and he wanted to tell his story. Mm -hmm from the stage because he's on this he's on the autistic spectrum and his like you know his his aspie superpower mm -hmm. is act he feels himself when he's on stage the rest of his life is a is a is a battle a constant mm -hmm. battle um so i spent the last basically 11 months hanging out with him interviewing him interviewing his parents looking at his condo hearing his stories and turning that into a one man play yeah that actually we're in the middle of our run right now um and it's going it's going so well uh people are responding because there's a there's power in storytelling right it's the power of the testimony sure when someone stands up and says this is my truth then everyone else goes oh i'm i'm not as weird as i thought <laughs> and you know and maybe right. i can share my truth yeah and not be a and have courage you know not be afraid that everyone's just gonna judge me or throw me to the side there mm -hmm. there's power in someone standing up and just saying this is my truth mm -hmm. Um, with no expectation um, and so Scotty Scott Aaron Price he's the actor uh, it's his story mm -hmm. um, it's very much told uh, we actually went and did a comedy a stand-up comedy boot camp together because he's a professional actor but he's never done direct address mm -hmm. theater before and you know mental illness can be a really heavy topic and I told him and his father who started the nonprofit to produce the show I said look this can't be a, a self-pitying angry this people don't want to come listen to you rant you know you've got to Right. bend them over you've got to be humble and open and vulnerable sure. and funny frankly mm -hmm. so i don't know if you're familiar with like a mike Birbiglia or hannah gadsby or neil brennan or chris Gethard. these are all comics today mm -hmm. who are 
kind of threading that needle between storytelling, stand-up comedy, and one man, one woman theater, mm -hmm. and using their own experiences. Like Mike Birbiglia has a life-threatening sleep illness. Oh. Anna Gadsby is on the spectrum. Chris Gedhart has severe depression. Neil Brennan has social anxiety, and they and they use these mental illnesses as fodder for amazing comedy, and it's super cathartic. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the path we tried to forge with Scotty too. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that it's funny and upbeat and loving. And then there's a moment where there's the gut punch, right? But you earn the moment to get super real if you've made friends first. Sure. So I got distracted by that story. So yes, I write my own stuff. Um, and I hope to sell my own books, but yeah. like this was a commission. So I was paid up front to develop wow. this piece, yeah. right? So there's the prong of, I write my own stuff mm -hmm. and take in commissions, mm -hmm. right? I publish other authors because then my company, I take my, my royalty cut from that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I'm doing like coaching and editing, you know, editing for other authors where I'm not necessarily going to publish them, mm -hmm. but I'll do a copy edit, right? Or I'll do a developmental edit, helping them with structure and, you know, story points. Um, and taking all that together, I'm, I cobble together the bills. <laughs> yeah. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah. Um, I did look at your website. And uh, very informative, and it just looks like you are crazy busy and crazy artistic. Uh, and I noticed too that you're you're part of this uh, Lifeline Productions, and it sounds like maybe this last piece is a part of that. Yes, Lifeline yeah. Productions is the new nonprofit that Scott's dad Joel started mm -hmm. to be a producing entity. So Lifeline's mission is to use art to tell true life stories of people with mental illness to yeah. put a dent in the stigma. Right. A, and an like me, this is the first project. Yeah, that that has to be well received, I would think. Oh, yeah, it's 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 sur it's surpassed what I was expecting. Um, mm -hmm. We had some developmental readings and people were just like, oh, yes, please. And now that means it's been full every night. We have a talk, we have a talk back after every performance because mm -hmm. people are desperate to share their own experience. Um, we're providing resources to people. You know, we've had people come in and as soon as Scott tells his story, they say, my son did that or I lost my daughter or mm. I once committed, tried to commit suicide, or, you know, mm. people just, they're so empowered to share. Wow. And by sharing, we own it, we make it smaller. Mm -hmm. right. We can then have a chance to overcome it or at least move forward, right? Sure. So it's being received great. And uh, the other cool thing we're doing is I published the script, so it's available to read as well through my through my Ibis Books website. Um, we hired a videographer who is capturing it kind of like a Netflix comedy concert or like mm. Hamilton on Disney. Yeah. So it's a three camera setup. He's come a couple of different nights and he's going to edit that into a Chris Rock special, right? Into, into an actual thing that we're going to sell DVDs, stream it, hopefully wow. on every channel that will have us. Again, the, I get it into film festivals, uh, but he's been filming behind the scenes too to make a documentary making of, yeah. you know, because it's not just the play itself. It's also, you also can go be a storyteller. Mm -hmm. right so as many ways as we can get the story out and the model out we're going to pursue those we're gonna, he's going to we're going to tour it live awesome. uh, hopefully yeah. hopefully get into universities you know whether it's him live whether it's him zooming or whether it's the film version streamed into a classroom whatever right it's really no skin off our nose how you get the story as long as it gets out there as mm -hmm. it gets out there but that's lifeline yeah that's the mission of lifeline uh you you may have mentioned this and i i i skipped over it the this this last thing you're talking about the kind of the mental health um piece that you were commissioned to write is the is the actor the person that actually uh is is the subject of the story also the actor in the story yes he is stage. both patient and performer yeah. yeah and that that was kind of one of the hooks yeah is that scott himself is a trained working actor and a lot of people don't know this stuff about him so it's kind of a coming out story for him right, right? Um, but yeah, he is, it's his story and he is the performer. And my, when we initially talked, we we're like, oh, we could license it to other people. To, but you know what? No one can do Dave Chappelle's standup except Dave Chappelle. You don't license out your standup. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. it wouldn't make sense for some, right. like the, the first two developmental readings I had to do because Scotty was in a show and then he got COVID the morning of the reading. Oh man. So I stepped in and I read the script to a test audience and it was still effective, but it would—it it makes no sense. It's got to be Scott sure. if it's going to be Scott's story, right? And that's another, another big reason to capture it on film so that it's preserved, so that it is the correct voice telling that story. Yeah. 
uh, you know, we often hear about entertainers who are remarkably funny on stage. Uh, I'm thinking of Robin Williams right now, but remarkably Absolutely. Funny, uh, yeah. who are just really engaging, but then behind, behind closed doors, they're, they're falling apart for yep. one of various reasons. So this Gene makes Wilder. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, huh? It's yeah. It's uh, a very, Matthew common, Perry, very right. common story. What? Uh, Matthew Perry. He's the, um, yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I forget his, Chandler from Friends, yep. he's incredibly funny, and then uh, battling all kinds of things, and, and yeah. tries to find solace in drugs, and then that's a whole other. Then that's an issue, right? And so, yep. um, and thankfully, most of these, a lot of these people get help, but a lot of don't. You know, a lot. So this, I can see where this would be really uh, strike a chord. It would strike a chord with a lot of a lot of people, not just not just actors, of course, but anyone that has a friend or family or themselves that's dealing with mental health issues. Absolutely. Well, the, the reason we picked. Just, yeah, right. the, the reason we picked May is it's National Mental Health Awareness Month. Right. That's why we even chose this month to put, because in our deep dive into it, I mean, and how much did the pandemic exacerbate the Come stuff on. that right. was already there? How much does mm -hmm. social media amplify? Right. Our how ironic that we're doing this right now. <laughs> yeah, well, and did you, know, you see, uh, you know, your point about social media, did you see that just this week, uh, the Surgeon General, uh, I believe right. that's what it was, released this this report that social media might be bad for young people um mm. <laughs> like just now but just now we're thinking that <laughs> so uh, yeah all that goes together to lead some people to have uh some serious problems on the inside but you you may or may yeah. not tell you know when you walk by them uh, on the street um and, and that's really the key there Dwayne is that it the, the problems are the problems but the the ultimate the ultimate outcome however the problem gets you there is that you feel alone mm-hmm Right, and so even in my deep dive, at the same time I was working on this play, I was uh, editing and publishing a memoir by a former student, um, Estrella, called Letters to Jim. She lost her husband of 40 years. Man. And in her grieving, she felt so alone. Yeah. Right, grieving can be a trigger. Mental illness is not just, you know, chemical or neurological or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can, it can be situational. Right. And she actually was at the show last night and she oh. stood up and said, Scott, oh my goodness, thank you. Because everything you've talked about, I am feeling that right now as I grieve for my husband. Mm -hmm. I feel so alone. Mm -hmm. And that solitude, again, back to the, so many things in our culture and society want to amplify that solitude. You're not enough. Something's mm -hmm. wrong with you. If right. only you bought this, you would be fine. You know, And all of those things just keep adding up. And the, and the mental health crisis today is just, it's, this is another... Florida, this is another reason Joel came, came to me. He was like, Florida is 49th in the country in spending for mental health access and support for people. I mean, it's just, so that's a very yeah. local thing. I don't know about Illinois, but. <laughs> yeah, which is, maybe the assumption is that you just go to the beach and you'll be fine. <laughs> or the, the warm weather or the pool would make it fine. Maybe maybe that's why they don't spend any money. I don't, I don't yeah. know. That's not a very salt good water, stat. Salt water can cure a lot, but not when there's red tide, you know, but yeah, yeah I mean, there <laughs> It's true. Who knows? Um, if you if you're touring, I know of a small theater on a small college campus in Southern Illinois uh, that could probably probably love to have you. Um, oh yeah. The uh, you participated in stuff here, didn't you? Didn't you do the you did all the theater things here? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. My my first year, um, I did the tour. It was I don't know if you still have Cornerstone. It's a touring theater group. Um, no. It was yeah. Uh, uh, we toured around doing a show. Actually, it was called I Am the Brother of Dragons. Amazing what you remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was about uh, a father who was addicted and abused his son. And I mean, we toured that thing. That you, the, it was one, one of the best audiences I've ever experienced doing. This is my freshman year in college. I'm this little fresh-faced Midwestern, know nothing, right? I come in and we learn to do the show. Right. We went to the Correctional Center in Dundalia. We went to that mm -hmm. prison mm -hmm. and we performed this show about drug addiction for that prison and that audience oh, wow. went went nuts for it. They they were so grateful. They were, I mean, it was similar to what I've been talking about with Scott, you know, just yeah. they was, oh, I, I know that guy, you know. Yeah. And that was, I mean, I walked in there like terrified doing the show, you know, I'm no Johnny Cash, I'm not in full right, <laughs> but all of a sudden this, right. this crowd just opened up and that was so transformative for me just as an artist at that very young impressionable age mm -hmm. but then yes the, my other three years at Greenville um I acted or directed in many shows there it was it was one of the funnest things I mean factory theater Dr. Keener um, yeah. 
just remember that you know i got to act with my brother west a couple times right. yeah. west john messina all you know yeah. all these all these wackadoodle guys <laughs> i uh I, I don't know how much you stay in touch at to greenville stuff but uh right before covid hit they they had a show in the factory theater so it, it had been used in 18 and, and 2019 and then covid shut it down mm. well, shut a lot of things down uh but we've recently reopened it and so oh, great. we've had two performances or two different uh, shows. There was a Christmas thing that was put together by students. I think it was written. I think it was some songs and some some acting uh, drama. And then uh, James and the Giant Peach was. Oh, uh, cool. I think it was last month. And I think there were four. Uh, let's see, there were, there were two weekends. Um, and my family and I went and I had forgotten how, how quaint and how um, attractive that little theater is. And my, my boys, my, I have three sons, my wife and I have three sons, and they were impressed with, it. it's in this old building that you think is yeah. going to fall down. It used but to be a glove the, factory. Yeah, <laughs> it's the, yeah, we're the gloves, they aren't around. And, um, you know, you park at the CVS drugstore across the street and you go in and you go up these <laughs> stairs, but they had not been in there before. And it was yeah. a whole different world. And then when the lights go off, you're in these chairs and the stage is right there. Like the stage is right there. And, yeah. you know, um, this was, this was a combination of community members and some high school kids, and then also some from, from the, the university. So my kids knew who some of these people were, but they're right. Oh, there, even better. Right acting. That forces them to like do that imagination. Oh, yeah. Man, that's so yeah cool. It was really cool. And I, I, you know, I had been, well, I was in college 25 years ago. And so well, we were, and I had forgotten about the factory theater as a real place. I mean, I, I know it academically that it's a yep. facility on campus and blah, blah, blah. But to actually go and to watch people, you know, be there and be interested and, and to watch a really neat performance of a really kind of quirky show with wonderful music. Um, I mean, I, I think that that sort of setting would be great for a show like what you're talking about. And I don't know what, you're, what you're looking at. Those are, those are details, but the, the closeness of that particular theater here in, in Greenville, um, I, I, there was a, it just seems like a really good connection with the audience, yeah. whatever the show is. And I remember in college, you know, your professor is, is uh, in, I don't know, I think Tartuffe was a, was one of the professors. Yes. Oh, Dr. Uh, Jensen, Dr. Jensen. That's right. Tartuffe. Yeah. That's and right. Dr. Jensen, you know, Steen, Dr. Jensen is, is in this big wig and that, yep. uh, and it, it is that community theater really is, really is attractive, especially, you know, a small college, small town. So can really uh, tie things together, yeah. And that, that reminds me, I forgot, but I'd written a play about J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, and my oh. aunt Vaughn, who's also an alum, she directed it in the Factory Theater. I got awesome. to go see that. Yeah, yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, well, it would be great to have you back, and, and maybe to have this show even when you're doing a tour. Um, and I, I do want to be conscious of your time. I just, um, I wanted to, you know, take maybe 30 minutes and just, and really just hear what you're doing. And this is fascinating. I knew that you were involved in, in, you know, theater and the arts. And I knew you were in Florida, but I didn't really, you know, I haven't talked to you and I haven't heard, heard your path, yeah. your work. And it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in what you're doing. I think, I think you're doing not only as an alum alumni director in my role, but I think, I think you're doing really important work. Uh, sometimes the arts entertain and sometimes the arts, you know, go beyond entertainment. And it sounds yeah. like you're kind of going to that, uh, visceral area of life with this mental health and, yeah. Using May, you know, obviously as a strategic time to launch this show. Uh, yeah. It sounds like you're doing really great work, Jason. I appreciate that, Dwayne. Yeah, it's, I mean, art always has to entertain first, right? It's the spoonful of sugar, right? Yeah, right uh, sure. But some stuff does go, and sometimes just entertainment's enough. Yeah. And then sometimes the entertainment allows you to go down here, right? Mm -hmm. I talked, actually, I did want to, I did want, if I could do one plug, um, go ahead. my most yeah. recent book that I wrote is called This Above All, How to Live an Artistic Life. And mm. um, my friend called it my anthem. You were talking about the way I talk about art and it, it, every, everything I've experienced in terms of theater and storytelling to this point in my life, I've kind of compressed into that book. Um, mm -hmm. It's even available as an audio book if you want to listen to my voice. <laughs> um, sure. But it was a thing where I started just writing. I've been threatening my students for years. I was going to write an acting book, you know, um, and I started to write it and then it was this other book kind of pulled me in and said, no, you, you need to, you need to offer a bigger gift than that. At this point, mm -hmm. you left full-time theater employment for a reason. And this book is kind of, the, you thought it was this reason that this is actually the reason. So the very first thing I published once I left was this book and it's 
um, to your point, Duane, it's all about how thinking artistically can amplify every part of your life, you know, intellectually, romantically, spiritually, in your work, in your play, mm -hmm. um, that so often art, this is where, it, this is why it sprung for me. Art can become precious, right? Art can be elite. Art can feel like it's not for you. And my mm -hmm. argument is exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. To your point about the factory theater, art is community. Mm -hmm. Art is democratic. Art is it, it, art is about including as many people as possible because it's just storytelling. A sculpture is a story. A painting is a story. A song is a story. Right? Marketing is a story. Mm -hmm. That end cap in the grocery store. It, there, there's a story. Mm -hmm. They're trying to hook you emotionally to purchase. Right. The, so the more you can understand story around you, the more you're going to be able to navigate a world that is constantly trying to tell you you're not enough. Mm -hmm. Art will tell you you're enough just the way you are. End of story, right? Yeah. So if, if that's at all interesting, I, I I try to access that in my book. <laughs> yeah. No, it is interesting. I think this is fascinating. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your work, Jason, and and uh, and your success. It sounds like you're doing really well, and uh, and I, I really enjoy talking to you. Um, and again, this is this is this is what it is. Just checking in on alumni, and uh, I don't have a plan, but I'd like to do a lot of these. And I think it'd be great. I would love, uh, yeah. With your permission, I'd, I'd like to, I, I think what the plan is, um, we have a social media person that helps, is we may put this whole thing out, uh, if you're fine with that. Yeah. Um, and then we also may break it up and and kind of keep using it. Um, Edit it down to a reel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a, like three minutes here, or 30 seconds here, and just kind of yeah. keep uh, keep utilizing it um, and collect these alumni stories and, and keep sharing you know, again, in one big one, and then maybe some smaller ones. And I, That's I, really cool. I, I would hope, really hope cool. you're fine with that. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever you want, whatever you need to do to, to help out Super. the alums and help out the university. Absolutely. Yeah. And we get down to Florida every now and then. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we try to get down to the Lakeland thing, but we have so many alumni in that kind of central Florida area. Um, yeah. Uh, the big swath in that Tampa, Orlando, yeah, yeah. obviously Lakeland, but that 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 swath that we have a lot of alumni down there. Mm -hmm. and, and we probably should get down there more often just to check in in person. But hey, thanks for your time. This has been really oh, it's been great a blast. To you and, and see how you're doing. And uh, and you'll you'll see yourself on our social media and our, our channels at some point soon. But this is really good. You're doing you're doing great work, Jason. Really proud of you. Thank you very much, Dwayne. And all love to the Greenville family there. Yeah. And yeah, I can't wait to see what you do with this. <laughs> yeah, Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time.